So another great quote, this time in German. I'm not going to try and read it in German. But the energy of the world is constant. The entropy of the world tends toward a maximum. Uh, you've heard of the, I, the heat death of the universe. So we'll get to the second law of thermodynamics. This is like one of the spooky, and since it's Halloween, it's coming up, it's October. Spooky consequences of the second law of thermodynamics, which is that the universe, or the entropy of the universe, which is the concentration of energy or the organization of matter, those are part of entropy, uh, always tends towards increasing. So even though here on, in small scale situations, we can take things and we can decrease entropy. So like air conditioning a room decreases the entropy in the room. Um, but it has to increase the entropy somewhere else more than it decreases the energy in that room. So the heat death of the universe is the eventual dispersal of all energy and all matter evenly amongst everything, all of the space in the universe. And so there will be no area that has more energy than another. Now that's going to take, I mean, an unfathomable amount of time because all of the stars will have to burn out and use up all of their energy. They'll have to supernova, and then everything eventually will cool uh, as that energy gets spread out. But in the meantime, we don't have to worry about that, because none of us are ever going to see that happen. Uh, yeah, so free energy and thermodynamics, though, on a smaller scale, is what determines whether or not a reaction is going to be spontaneous or not. So. Right, for precipitation reactions up until now, um, we've been doing precipitation reactions. And when you mix those two liquids together, they react. And that's a spontaneous reaction. They don't require any extra energy to be input for the process to happen. So in other words, um, well, sorry, in other words, in, to start from the beginning, uh, Energy transaction, transactions are like gambling. The house always wins. So you cannot win. Even though you can take energy and put it one place, uh, every time you move energy anywhere, you lose a little bit of it as heat. And that heat just gets dispersed uh, into the surroundings. So first law of thermodynamics is energy is conserved in chemical processes. And that doesn't mean that all of the energy goes into directly causing the reaction to happen, some of that gets lost. So for cars especially, um, actually pretty inefficient. Only 20% of the energy from burning gasoline uh, in combustion goes towards moving the car, and the rest gets dissipated as heat. And obviously, engines get really hot. That's why you need antifreeze. You need coolant. If your engine overheats, it stops working. Um, but also, every single thing that's turning that's rubbing against something else, even if it has bearings, is losing a little bit of energy as heat. And so that all causes inefficiency. I think the most efficient they've been able to get a gasoline engine is something like 30%, maybe 40%. So the energy from that chemical reaction goes towards uh, energy moving the car, and then the rest is lost as heat. So you can't win. You can't create energy that wasn't there to begin with. It has to come from somewhere. In fact, you can't even break even. So we'll get into the second thermodynamics, or second law of thermodynamics in a bit. Um, but for example, if you have a rechargeable battery, right, if you've ever had like a really fast charger for your phone, phone gets hot while it's charging. That charging process, that heat, that's inefficiency in the chemical battery in your phone to store the energy that's being pushed through it by the electricity coming out of the wall. And even then, when you're using your phone, as you're using it, it's dissipating or it's using that energy to, you know, play Candy Crush or Bejeweled, which is a super old game, right? Or Farm Town. I'm just going to name all the oldest games I can think of for phones, um, right? As you're using that, if you're playing games on your phone, your phone gets hot too, and it's not the um, well. Part of it is the processing. There's inefficiency in the electrons turning the ones and zeros on and off and switching circuits. Um, and also, the dissipation of energy from the battery itself is inefficient. So you're losing energy at every single one of those places to that heat. So it's never destroyed. 
Uh, you'll never get 100, exactly 100 kilojoules out of a battery, but some of it comes out as heat. And the heat tax is inevitable. Always happens. Uh, additional energy is also lost, uh, well, because most real pro world processes, actually all real world processes, are not 100% efficient. So the fewer transactions that you have, the more efficient your energy use is. Now, this is actually um, pretty relevant for things like electric cars. Um, here it's talking about heating. Heating with natural gas, because the whole point is to generate heat. Um, you lose some heat towards collecting the natural gas and refining it and then putting it into pipes and sending it to people's homes. But once you actually get the natural gas, you're burning it to generate heat. And you are paying a heat tax there, but you want heat. So this is the only time where it's technically 100% efficient. And that's only because you wanted, to heat, you wanted heat in the first place. For something like using electricity though, right? for natural gas, of course, collecting, storing, transporting, but you have to burn a fossil fuel, or now solar panels, uh, but the solar panels have to be created. Right? The manufacturing of solar panels takes energy. The mining of the materials that goes into the solar panels takes energy. Um, but once you, so if you're burning fossil fuels, that turns turbines. Some energy is lost there as heat. Uh, you make the steam, which is, loses energy as heat. Generating electricity loses energy as heat. Then transporting that energy, over high voltage transmission lines, you're losing some heat there as well. And then even just energizing the electric heater in your home uh, is why, well, I guess that's where the heat tax is going towards what you want it to do. So even though once the electricity is in the heater and you're turning all of it into heat, uh, it was so much more inefficient to actually get it to you. The same thing is the case with um, electric cars, of course. Electric cars require a lot of materials and harder to mine minerals like lithium to create the batteries. That has to be mined somewhere. That's more intensive than uh, the processes for making gasoline cars. Uh, and then eventually, they have to be charged. And so unless that electricity all comes from a green source, then you have to burn fossil fuels anyway to generate. So it's all way more complicated uh, I think in the long run, electric vehicles are going to be good, but we've got to move other energy sources to green. Moral of the story, though, anytime you do anything, anytime you move anything, anytime you create anything, you lose some of that energy as a heat tax. So in terms of chemistry, though, um, we can take this idea now that like, right, our reactions, what makes them go forward, what makes them spontaneous, and it's kind of analogous to mechanical systems. So in a mechanical system, you have some amount of potential energy by some object. Gravity is the easiest. You hold something up. Right? It has gravitational potential energy, because when you let it go, it will fall. And that's spontaneous. Right? The only energy you have to put into it is getting it up there. But once let go of, it'll fall. So we need to find a chemical analog to that gravitational potential energy. So what gives a chemical, chemical potential energy? Because if we can find that, it's going from a higher energy, higher chemical potential to a lower chemical potential. Um, so it's going to tell us if we've got a spontaneous reaction or not. So spontaneity and speed are different things, just like at equilibrium, it's going to be different than uh, initial conditions for kinetics, right? Um, so if we have a spontaneous reaction, um, it may be thermodynamically spontaneous. So that means that the chemical potential of your reactant is higher than the chemical potential of, well, it's not the only thing that goes into spontaneity, but we'll get there. So you might have something that's favorable in terms of the thermodynamics, so it's going to happen, like rusting, but kinetically is very slow. Right? It takes iron a long time to rust. Um, so spontaneous reaction is not necessarily a fast reaction. And a non-spontaneous process is not impossible, but you have to give it extra energy to cause that reaction to happen.
which we'll talk about too when we get to electrochemistry, right? providing that extra energy in the form of electricity. So I mentioned the uh, mentioned enthalpy in terms of the heat death of the universe. Um, could we use enthalpy for a chemical? Oh, sorry, no. I mentioned uh, entropy for uh, heat death of the universe. Enthalpy, though, is a different thing, and that's determining the amount of heat released or absorbed by a chemical reaction. All right, so that's uh, exothermic or endothermic. So an exothermic reaction is going to have a negative delta H, and an endothermic reaction has a positive delta H. And the sort of mental image that I find most helpful for remembering this is that if we have our reaction in this box, delta H is negative because it's describing the flow of heat to or from our chemical reaction. So if heat's going out of the box, it's being withdrawn. Also, uh, an ATM is a useful analogy, right? When you withdraw money from the ATM, that shows up as a negative on your uh, on your bank account. For an endothermic reaction, we have our reaction, and it's enthalpy, delta H is positive because we're adding heat, we're adding energy, heat energy, into the reaction, right? So it's being added to the reaction, the change is positive, and it's all from the perspective of the reaction. Uh, this doesn't work, though, in terms of predicting whether or not something is going to be spontaneous or not, uh, because we have some endothermic reactions, so releasing heat, or sorry, absorbing heat, uh, that are spontaneous. One of those is chemical cold packs. So you can get a, or chemical ice packs, right? You can take it, and there's a little vial inside, you break that little vial, and it um, starts absorbing lots of large amounts of heat, and you can use it to uh, ice a wound. Um, so what is chemical potential then? So consider the following spontaneous processes that involve an increase in enthalpy. So if we're melting ice, if you're melting ice above zero degrees C, um, it's actually an endothermic process. It has to absorb heat, uh, and that's spontaneous. So it's dependent on temperature. Uh, the evaporation of liquid water to gaseous water is also endothermic. It's taking in that extra energy to go from a liquid to a gas. That's why sweat is cooling, um, as long as the sweat can evaporate. Or even the dissolution of sodium chloride in water. And so you add salt crystals to water, and they dissolve, they separate, and spread out. Uh, what do these all have in common? They're all what? They're all endothermic. They're all, all endothermic. But we know that enthalpy, or change in enthalpy doesn't, doesn't matter. Because we can have, these are spontaneous processes that are also endothermic. They're changing phases. Uh -huh. And are they going, how do, how do I word this question? What, what direction are these, like the phase changes in, in particular? I guess these are all phase changes, right? For each of these phase changes, there's something similar about which state they're changing from and which state they're going to. Trending upwards in energy. Yeah, because they're all endothermic. How about the constraints on the atoms and molecules themselves? They're getting what? Less, they're getting less constrained. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so if we're going from a solid to a liquid, they're spreading out. If we're going from a liquid to a gas, it's also spreading out. And then for something, right, salt crystals dissolving in water, they're spreading out. So this is the idea of entropy. So for each of these processes, the disorder or randomness increases. 
You can think of that as by removing constraints on how those molecules can be arranged, right? In a solid, they have fixed locations inside of that solid. They're not mobile. So there's really just one phase, one state that they can be in. Once it's dissolved or once it's melted in terms of ice into a liquid, now the molecules are free to move around. And then you have, however statistically you would calculate, the number of molecules of water and how many different positions they could be in. And then for a gas, that increases even, even further because now they're no longer constrained to just the little puddle of water, but to whatever space they're in. And same for the salt crystals also. Right? They're dissolving and now the salt crystals are, can be anywhere inside of the solution instead of just trapped in their crystals. So the informal definition is disorder or randomness. Increasing entropy increases the disorder or increases the randomness of a system. So entropy is a thermodynamic function that increases with the number of energetically equivalent ways to arrange the components of a system to achieve a particular state. Now uh, we'll get into a really, really good visual of that. Uh, we can describe it with this equation though, where K is the Boltzmann constant, um, which is given here as 1.3 times 10 to the negative 23 joules per Kelvin. And W is unitless, but it's the number of energetically equivalent ways to arrange the components uh, of the system. So our units of entropy are joules per Kelvin. So it's dependent on temperature and it's dependent on energy. So if you imagine a fixed amount of an ideal gas at constant state, or constant pressure, volume, and temperature, which is why I pulled this thing up, I'll put it up in a second. Uh, the energy of that system is constant. Pressure's not changing, volume's not changing, temperature's not changing. It's a set amount of energy. But the exact distribution of that energy throughout the gas is gonna change from instant to instant. So you can have some particles that have really high kinetic energy moving really fast, other ones that could be almost completely stationary. Um, due to just collisions with other particles. So I think I might be able to make this bigger. Let's see. Edit, transform. Oh, wait, maybe I can just do it like this. All right, so for this system, easy enough to see, right? We have some particles that are moving really fast, other ones, like this one, moving pretty slow until it gets hit by something. The energy is distributed. There's the same amount of energy inside of this whole system. It's not changing uh, the total amount of energy, but the energy of individual particles is gonna be high or low, um, or in between. And so this is a representation of entropy, right? Every single one of these particles could be moving fast or slow or in between. They could be moving up, they could be moved down, left or right. Um, there's a lot of different possible options, a lot of different states that this system could be in and have the same amount of energy. Oops. So that is the, do we get macro state? Yeah, that's the, the macro state is like the overall state of the energy in that system. And the micro state is the exact internal energy distribution among the particles at any one instant. So if we took this, is there a way you can pause it? Yeah, so I can freeze it at any one point. And if we had little indicators of which way they were going, right, we could see how much energy each of these individual particles has. Or even just another way we can, another analog for it is sort of just even the number of different places that each particle could be inside of this box. And so any, for any given microstate, right, I can keep hitting play and pause, that mi those microstates are always changing. And they're always random. 
go back to this. So the macro state, the overall energy state of the system, can exist as a result of all of those microstates. So any single one of those microstates could be inside of the same, or could be under the same definition of the macro state. So total amount of energy versus the energy of the individual things that make up the system. So W, which is from the uh, S equals K natural log of W, right? Yeah, natural log. W is the number of possible microstates that can occur in a given macrostate. So for this particle in a box situation, that's an insane number of microstates. Even if, we, even if we're just considering where each particle could possibly be inside the box, right? If any particle could be in every given state, it's practically an infinite number, even though there's only 150 particles in the box. But we can simplify this a bit and talk about smaller systems. So if we have this two particle system, we've got system A and we've got system B, and we've got two different, or they have different energy levels that could possibly be occupied. So for system A, we have two energy states that have, or one, sorry, one energy microstate um, with one set energy of two joules. All right, so each particle is at two joules of energy for a total of four. So only one microstate. But system B has two energy levels, one of them at one joule and one of them at three joules. Again, though, the total energy is the same. So the macrostate of system A and system B is the same. Uh, the microstate of B is different and has two possibilities. Zoom in on this. Oh yeah, can you? Yeah, you can kind of see that those are red and blue. So this one's red. And then in system B, there's a second possible microstate where the blue particle is in the higher energy and the red particle is in the lower energy state. So overall entropy still four, or overall uh, enthalpy is still four joules. But the entropy is dependent on how many possibilities there are. So with two particles and two energy levels, there's only two possibilities. So system B has the greater entropy because there's two possibilities. So we can expand this from, oh wait, a couple more slides. So the energy of a state increases with the number of energetically equivalent ways to arrange the components to achieve a particular energy state. So how can we arrange all of the pieces inside of the whole? The number of ways that we can do that uh, is the number of microstates and is the entropy of the system. So the state with the highest entropy also has the greatest dispersal of energy. It's the uh, number of microstate options means that the energy can be dispersed amongst all of those microstates. So for B, for system B, it's dispersed over two energy levels, where in system A, you can think of it as being concentrated into a single energy level. So if we had more energy levels, we could have it, our energy dispersed between all of those energy levels. So a state in which a given amount of energy is more highly dispersed or randomized has more entropy than a state in which the same energy is more highly concentrated. So the more that we can spread things out, uh, the more entropy we have, which is the whole idea of the heat depth of the universe, because eventually everything spreads out. Uh, and that's the second law of thermodynamics. For any spontaneous process, the entropy of the universe increases. So it tends towards more and more and more microstates across the entire universe. So the criteria of spontaneity 
is the entropy of the universe. And entropy is a state function. So state functions only depend on the state of the system, not how you get there. Um, oh, I had an analogy for this earlier. I mean, it's kind of like ordering a packet, ordering something from Amazon. You don't know where it goes or how it travels, but it gets to you eventually. And so a state function only depends on the fact that it gets to you. So the state of you being happy with Amazon or not is whether or not you get your package. <laughs> I suppose there was one time I flew to Alaska and uh, I flew out of Fresno and my flight went to uh, LA and then flew to Seattle and then Alaska. So it was like I flew in the exact wrong direction. But the state of me being in Alaska or not <laughs> didn't matter because I got there either way. All right, so state functions, it's what the state of the system is doesn't matter on how you get to that state. So uh, have we gone over it? Have we had a delta in any of our equations yet? Maybe. All right, so delta means a change in. So it's going to be your entropy of the finals minus the entropy of the initial. All right, here's the analogy that I wanted to get to. So we talked about super simple system. Well, I showed you a very complicated system uh, in this simulation of gas particles in a box. That's practically an infinite number of um, states. And then we went to a super simple system that had just two energy microstates. And we saw that we had two options there, right? Red on top or blue on top. Um, for chemical systems are going to be all more complicated, like the simulation, but we can consider another slightly more complicated uh, than the, the two red and blue particles. So chemical systems proceed in a direction that increases the entropy of the universe overall. So if we have these uh, ideal gas particles in a box, and then we have a vacuum in this other flask, and they're separated by a stopcock. Uh, so the pressure against which this, these particles expands is zero. So it's actually not doing any work. So it takes zero work for it to move from one side to the other. So the total energy of the system doesn't change. No work is being done. No energy is expended. But our entropy changes because now our particles, I mean, what are they going to do? If there's a vacuum in this side and we've got a gas on the other side, when I open this valve, yeah, some of those particles are going to rush over to the other side. So we've got a few different possible states uh, that'll be energetically equivalent. But looking at just these three, um, how many microstates are possible for each macrostate? I think this might have been a two-part slide, because I think this is the answer. So we could have all of the particles on one side. We have all the particles on the other side. We could have one particle each on either side. And that's just to name three of them. Because we could do one particle on one side, three particles on the other side. All right, so we could run through all of those iterations. And those are the macro states. But if we label them one through four, and so we track sort of in where each individual particle goes. Um, for states A and B, only one microstate is possible. So for in state A, one, two, three, and four have to be on one side. So this would be, um, this may be not illustrated here super well. This is as if we opened the stopcock and they didn't move. So all of the particles would stay on one side and none of the particles would be on the other side. In microstate B, it's the opposite that happens. So now suddenly we open the stopcock and all of the gas moves from one flask to the other flask and now there's a vacuum on the other side. 
right? And we know that that's not what happens. Right? When we open this up, they all spread out. So state C, which is the one above, where we have two particles on each side. Now we have six different possible uh, microstates. We could have, I should zoom in on this, right? It could be one and two in the left flask, and three and four in the right flask, or two and three and one and four, one and three, two and four, two, four, one, three, one, four, two, three, three, four, or you could do all of these. Um, so there's a lot more states than in the other two options. So what can we say about the entropy of state C versus states A and states B? Has more entropy, has way more energy. All right, so if we have the more microstates we have, which was W, so if S is equal to K, which is a constant, times the natural log of W, W is the number of microstates. So more microstates means more energy. Um, and that's not to say that it couldn't happen where all of the particles ended up on one side. But the entropy of that is so much higher than being spread out between the two flasks that it's practically never gonna happen. In fact, in this room, there's nothing stopping from all of the air particles from suddenly rushing to one corner of the room and suffocating us. <laughs> but it's not gonna happen because that would be so uh, entropically unfavorable, right? It would be moving everything into a single microstate rather than the billions of options being spread out through the room. So this gets, these numbers get astronomical pretty quickly. I cannot remember what the math is. It might be the factorial of the number of things. Actually, I could try that real quick. Does this have a factorial? Yeah, it does. Uh, no, not quite. Yeah, there, there's some statistics going on here. But if we had 20 atoms in that situation, microstate A, or macrostate A, so we go back to these macrostates A. So if we have 20 particles now instead of four, we could still have state A where they're all on one side or state B where they're all 20 are on the other side, and that's still one microstate each. The option where we have them split 50-50 between the two flasks now has, talking about the combinations here, 184,756 different microstates, unique microstates, ways that you can organize the particles on both sides of the flasks. And so that's just 20 particles. You can imagine if you had one mole of gas in the flask. Now we go from 20 to 6.22 times 10 to the 23. And if 20 goes to 184,000, then not even really thinking about it very hard, but just like, if it's even scales proportionally, it would be like six orders of magnitude greater than the 6.02 times 10 to the 23, so it'd be like 6.022 times 10 to the 29 microstates, and that's not how it works, so it's more than that. Um, actually, the other relatable thing is if you have uh, a deck of cards, right, it's just 52 cards. Basically, if you shuffle a deck of cards, the odds of it being in the same, uh, uh, same order as another deck of cards being shuffled is astronomical. There are more, more possible combinations for a deck of cards than there are like have been seconds in the universe, essentially. It's like, oh my gosh. I can't talk right now. Oops, lock it. Um. Okay, so, right, so that being said, we can have all these different microstates uh, versus just one microstate for A and B. So entropy is always going to increase, so it's always going to maximize the number of possible microstates. So whatever is the maximal is what it's gonna be, and the maximal is distributed evenly between the two flasks. So the change in entropy from state A, if we start, because we're starting in state A, and going to state C is positive. So we can calculate the entropy. We don't really have to use the Boltzmann constant. 
Well, it's going to be a positive entropy because our final state has a higher entropy than our initial state, which is an entropy or one microstate. So we the natural log of one times the Boltzmann constant. So when all of the atoms are confined to one flask, their energy is also confined. And when they're evenly distributed, their energy is spread out over the greater volume. And that energy is dispersed. So the second law explains phenomena not explained by the first law. So you have ice, water. Heat travels from the water to the ice, and not the other way, um, to melt the ice. The first law does not prohibit the ice from becoming colder and the water getting warmer. So that's a possibility, but that would not increase the entropy of the universe. That would be a decrease in entropy. Because if the heat is, uh, more heat is leaving the ice, then it's becoming more ordered, less disordered. So according to the second law, energy is dispersed and not concentrated. So any gradient is going to cause spontaneous things to happen. So the ent entropy of a sample of matter increases its changes, changes state from a solid to a liquid, from a liquid to a gas. Because again, in a solid, all of those water molecules in the solid are confined to a single place. Now they could be vibrating at different energy levels, but they're not moving around. So by default, has a smaller number of microstates. Good. It, uh, it melts, now the water molecules can move around, and that's hugely favorable in terms of entropy. Because now you can not only have them moving at different speeds, but they can be arranged differently. Then going from a gas, we've increased entropy once again um, and by not a small margin. All right, because a gas has more ways to distribute that energy than a solid. And this is kind of, I mean, this is the thing for entropy. If it can be arranged differently, if it can be arranged more ways, that's more entropy. So solid is, right, all the energy is limited to vibrations. In gas, you have straight line motions. The molecules can be rotating. Um, in addition to having energetic vibrations. And the gas has more places to put the energy, so more microstates. So you can, in general, predict the sign of delta S, right, if entropy is going to be increasing. So phase transition from a solid to a liquid, it's going to be an entropy, change in entropy is greater than zero, right, positive entropy. Uh, and then from solid to gas, and from liquid to a gas. And an increase in the number of moles of a gas uh, during a chemical reaction is also going to create more entropy. So if you were at two uh, like if you had, think of a reaction off the top of my head. Well, you could have, um, right, methane plus oxygen. It's not really going to go in one direction. It's really going to go in one direction. That's a gas. That's a gas. And we can just, all right, it's going to make CO2 plus H2O. Uh, is this going to create increase? For methane, it. Oh, yeah, because there's two of those. Mm, for methane, it actually doesn't. Uh, ethane definitely will. Uh, but now I gave myself an odd number of oxygens. All right, well, this is why you prepare ahead of time. Ran out of time. Grading for Chem 20 because the deadline's tomorrow for a drop date. Uh, so but if you increase the number of moles of gas, that is going to be entropically favorable because 
you're increasing entropy because you have more particles that are now flying around. If there's more particles flying around, then there's more ways that they can be arranged. Right? Like going from four particles in our two flasks to 20 particles went from six microstates to 184,000 microstates. Okay, so for each of these processes, predict the sign of delta S. So if we're going from water, gas, to water, liquid, is water more free as a gas or as a liquid? As a gas. So if it's going from a gas to a liquid, is entropy increasing or decreasing? Decreasing. So that means that we'd have a negative delta S. How about solid carbon dioxide subliming? What's that? Positive, yeah. So we're going from a solid to a liquid, or to a gas, I mean. Solid straight to a gas, so it's going to be increasing entropy. And then for, oh good, there's a chemical example. Two moles of dinitrogen monoxide decomposing to make uh, nitrogen and oxygen gas. Positive entropy. Because we're growing from just two moles of a gas or two molecules to three. So more particles, more different options for how they can be organized. So a change in state is also going to be accompanied by a change of heat between the system and the surroundings. Entropy is related to the distribution of energy among the particles that compose matter. So a change in entropy when a system exchanges a quantity of heat with its surroundings at constant temperature is going to be represented by a change in entropy is the uh, Q of a reversible process divided by the temperature in kelvins. So those are the units of entropy. Right, joules per Kelvin. So entropy then is also a measure of the energy dispersal per unit temperature. So when something melts, it absorbs energy from its surroundings, and that energy becomes dispersed in the system as it gets picked up by all of the particles that are dispersed. So that's why we have um, the delta H of vapor, or uh, what do we say, melting here? Delta H of fusion. Right. There's an amount of energy that's required to either freeze or to melt really any solid liquid system, right? So water, um, when water is, or when ice is melting to become water, that takes an extra amount of energy over just increasing the temperature. So a reversible process is one that reverses direction upon an infinitesimally small change in some property. So ice melting and surroundings at zero degrees C is reversible because just a tiny, tiny, tiny change in the amount of heat will start it going from melting to freezing because we're at its freezing temperature. So any small change is going to flip that back and forth. Ice melting on a countertop at room temperature, though, would not be reversible. It would be irreversible because it would take more than just a small amount of heat. It would take all of the heat to get back to zero for that to start freezing again. So reversible processes, uh, or reversible processes are in a constant state of equilibrium and, of course, are highly idealized because you're never going to have that situation where you're perfectly at zero degrees and you're able to make an infinitesimally small change in the temperature. Except under like the most ridiculous controlled conditions. So this is kind of the ideal gas equivalent of um, entropy. So if we have then a gas, 
or if we have uh, acetone vaporizing at its normal boiling point. So if we're at its normal boiling point, we're going to assume this is an ideal situation uh, or an idealized situation and that it's a reversible process because it's at its boiling point. We can calculate delta S, um, which is going to be joules per Kelvin. And then we also have delta H of vaporization, which is 29.1, I'll just make joules lowercase, but it's capitalized, uh, kilojoules per mole. So we can use these two equations and some other general chemistry to figure out what that change in entropy is based on 10 grams of acetone. So how do we figure out, how do you solve this problem? Grams to moles. Grams to moles. Uh, so we need the molar mass of acetone. So 12.01 times 3 plus 6 times 1.01 uh, plus 16. So it's 58.09. Fifty-eight point oh nine grams for mole. So ten divided by fifty-eight point oh nine is going to be one point, or it's going to be zero point one seven two moles of that acetone. And the delta H of vaporization is per mole of uh, acetone that vaporizes. So we can take this 0 0.172 moles of acetone and multiply that by delta H of vaporization. And that gives us a number of kilojoules. Let's look at zero nine. And then we know how to get from kilojoules to joules. So there's a thousand joules per one kilojoule. Um, I see. So we multiply it by a thousand. So now it's five thousand and nine kilojoules, or five thousand nine joules. Now what else do we need? Change Celsius to Kelvin, so 56.1 uh, plus 273.15. So we divide our joules by Kelvin, and it's 3.29 uh, times 10 to the 2, 2925. My calculator is in scientific mode. So 5,009 divided by temperature in Kelvin is going to mean that 15.2 joules per Kelvin uh, equals delta S. This is one of those solve problems that you can solve magically with unit analysis. All right. We knew that if you, if you know that, you can calculate delta S as joules per Kelvin, 
and we have delta H of vaporization, and we have a massive acetone, then it's knowing that we can convert grams to moles, then use moles in the delta H of vaporization to convert from moles to kilojoules, and that we can convert temperature into Kelvin, and by dividing those two, because that gives us the right units, that also gives us the answer. Magic. All right, well, that is all I plan to get through today. 